His name is Tommy Ryan. He had a full head of hair and the perfect little button nose. Welcome to Still a Part of Us, a place where moms and dads share the story of their child who was stillborn or who died in infancy. I'm Winter. And I'm Lee. We are grateful you joined us today. Please note that this is a story of loss and has triggers. Thanks to our lost parents who are willing to be vulnerable and share their children with us. If you're listening to this podcast, just know that on our YouTube channel, there are pictures and videos that are related to the stories that are being shared. Subscribe and share it with a friend that might need it and tell them to subscribe. Why? Because people need to know that even though our babies are no longer with us, they're still a part of us. We are so thankful to have Kirby on today to tell the story of her son, Tommy. Um, Kirby, thank you so much for reaching out to us and and welcome to the podcast today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to share Tommy with you guys. Yeah. Um, so tell us a little bit about yourself. Who, uh, Where are you guys at? And tell me who's in your family right now. And um, yeah, let's, let's just start from there. Sure. So I, we live in Maryland, in um, Catonsville, Maryland, actually. And I am currently a stay-at-home mom with our two rainbow babies. And my husband often laughs and says every day is like Christmas. <laughs> and obviously that's a little bit of an exaggeration, but we do have a lot of fun. Um, <laughs> so basically on a daily basis, yeah, it's just all about the boys and we like to go to, they like to go to the creek and the playground and the farm. And so we spend a lot of time outside. They have cousins in the area that are their age. So my sister and her husband have two little ones and they live like a mile down the street. So that's really nice. And then our other sister just bought a house in Catonsville as well. So (laughs) she is like in between us, which is really neat. And then both of our parents are close by. Um, So again, the boys love going over my parents to see my mom and brother and sister during the week and play outside and things like that. So we have a pretty low key fun life. (laughs) Yeah. It sounds super full. Like when we talked earlier, I just was like, oh, this sounds so fun and wonderful. Um, So I'm excited to dig into this a little bit more. Um, And you guys, uh, so it sounds like you guys like to be outside and be with family mostly. Is there anything that you like to do uh, as a personal hobby, personal hobbies? Sure. Um, I love reading actually. And I read every night. I should, I probably stay up too late reading, but (laughs) I'm like an anxious person by nature and reading just calms me down and it's just been really good for my anxiety and just overall wellness. So yeah, I read every night. Um, I used to love to exercise. Obviously it's not like the season for that right now with raising the boys, but, um, we do take walks and things like that. Um, I used to do yoga, obviously, with COVID. And like I said, there's not too much time for that now, but I would like to get back into yoga. Um, I like to bake. Awesome. Let's see. I cook dinner every night. You know, it's not my favorite, but baking (laughs) is is definitely fun for me. Yeah. Um, Yeah, we like to be outside and obviously spend time with family. And I think that's about it. That's awesome. And how did you and um, Tom meet? Are you guys both from so, Maryland? We are. So we actually grew up like a few miles away from each other, mm-hmm. but we didn't know each other growing up. We met um, when I was in college and I, we met through his brother. Oh. Um, so I was friends with his brother. Yeah. And Tom came, Tom graduated from a different college and he came to visit and things like that. So we met through him. Nice. We met through Joey, Tom's brother. Nice. That's, that's yeah. the way to go right there. <laughs> uh, I know. It was great. And then we realized we're like, oh my gosh, like we, we really, went to the same yeah. high school and all this stuff, but like we never knew each other. Yeah. So. We just kind of passed each other and didn't realize it. <laughs> um, okay. So, and, and just a little bit of context, how long ago was Tommy born at, just for everybody's context at the time of this recording? Sure. So he was born January 6, 2018. And so that is like three years and three months. Yeah. 
It seems it goes by so quickly, doesn't it? Just it's like it does. Oh. It, it is crazy to say that three years. Yeah, is crazy. Yeah, it really is. So, and so, tell me a little bit about that pregnancy. Were you guys planning on getting pregnant? Was fertility an issue? Sure. So the pregnant, we actually were blessed to get pregnant pretty quickly after trying. Mm-hmm. Um, the pregnancy overall, in terms of like checkups and everything, it was pretty routine, according to the doctors. Um, at our 20 week scan, everything looked great. I did have awful morning sickness. So, oh, okay. I was so sick. Um, I probably, like, I'm not exaggerating, threw up at least once a day, like oh. the entire pregnancy. The entire pregnancy? <laughs> but, oh. Yeah. And everyone kept saying, like, after the first trimester, and then, okay, some people um, get sick until 20 weeks, and <laughs> okay. And then, like, after a while, I was like, I feel like this isn't going to go away. It did end up, I guess, like, it wasn't as strong as the first trimester, but mm-hmm. it was still to the point of, like, I could wake up every morning and get sick. And then, In the evenings, like come seven o'clock, like they, you know, they say it's morning sickness, but like mine was pretty bad at night too. So, (laughs) but overall, I honestly like just kept saying like, it's fine. I'm just so excited because I had always wanted to be a mom. Mm -hmm. Like ever since I was a little girl, like that's all I wanted to be was a mom. And my brother is about... 10 years of me, my brother and I are like 10 years apart. Mm -hmm. So I'm one of five and he's the youngest. And when he was born, I'll never forget. Like it was the greatest thing ever (laughs) because I could, I was old enough. I was in fourth grade. So I was old enough to like help my mom take care of him. And, you know, I just was like a little mom. And it was funny because my mom jokes about it now, but like there was times where she had to remind me like, okay, she's the mom. It's fine. Like she's like, Jerry's fine. Um, Yeah. But I just, I loved baby dolls and Barbies and all of that. So yeah, I just always wanted to be a mom. So I was like, really tried not to complain about the sickness because I was just so thankful. Yeah. Oh, but that's, that's a lot of sickness. (laughs) It was, it was exhausting. (laughs) Oh, I am sure. I'm sure it was. (laughs) And so at um, the 20 week visit, he looked great. And were you guys planning on finding out the gender at that time or... So we wanted to keep it a surprise, um, and which we did. We kept it a surprise all the way until he was born. Oh. And it was just something that I had always thought would be really neat. And my sister was pregnant at the time, too. So mm-hmm. she, we were due like two months apart from each other. So she and her husband also didn't find out the gender. And so it was really kind of fun during the pregnancy because we were like, oh, my gosh, it could be like two girls who are going to grow up together, like a boy and a girl or two boys. And so, I mean, it was, we were happy that we waited, I guess. Yeah. And so did you guys have kind of a a running list of names then? (laughs) That's always tricky. We had, um, well, we knew like if he was a boy, we were going to do a junior. And then for a girl, we, we ended up picking the name Logan. We thought that would Mm. be really sweet if we had a girl. So that's great. That's good. Good job for choosing the names. It sounded like you guys <laughs> had a, <laughs> you were clear on what you wanted. So that's good. Cause people fight about that. <laughs> the names. Yeah. And I guess it took us, I can't really remember, but I feel like it maybe took us a little while to like agree on one, but then we both liked both of those. So that's awesome. it was, that was good. That's great. So let's um, kind of go in a little bit more into the story and Tell me kind of the series of events that led you to finding out what happened. Sure. So I forgot to add that I was at the time um, a special educator Mm. and I was taking um, master's classes to get my master's as well. Mm -hmm. So I was like really busy um, leading up to, I guess I'll go through the events of like the week leading up to his birth and then obviously through his birth. Yeah. Um, But we, sorry, I'm like, I'm like trying to figure out where I want to start. So like I said, okay, so I was a special educator at the time. Mm-hmm. And I was getting my master's class. I mean, sorry, I was taking classes to try to get a master's degree. Mm-hmm. Um, So we had winter break. And this was awesome, because I, I like felt like I really needed a break. <laughs> I was tired. And I was just like, my family and I um always went to the beach for new year's um so we did that Mm -hmm. 
and we went to the beach and it was great. And I did notice that his movements were a little bit off at the beach. Like I definitely felt him, but I noticed that they were a little bit off. Do you, so of course, when like you, I said, I was when you mean, an anxious person. Uh, sorry, I, I'd hate to interrupt you. Uh, when you say that his his movements were off, were they just like kind of a little bit more sporadic or was it more like less or more or just at different was, times? Right. So it was definitely less movement. Like he had before, like they say the kick count and I, I could get like 10 kicks within like, I felt like a minute. Like mm-hmm. it was just like, he's I pretty just, active, he very active mm-hmm. throughout the entire pregnancy. And then I remember thinking at the, when we were at the beach thinking like, okay, like this is kind of strange. Like he's not moving as much. And I Googled it and I was like ta- saying it to my sister and my mom and stuff. And, you know, you actually read on Google like, oh, once you're so far along, like, and the baby could come at any time, like they are running out of room in there. And obviously I know that that's like not the case now, but I just kind of like, tried to go with that like okay and I did have an appointment on that Tuesday when we got back so I was like okay if you know come Sunday when we are like on our way home if it's if I still feel like it's like this then maybe I'll call on Monday but I felt him on the way home and I did my because I was really able to like zone in and like as we were sitting as I was sitting in the passenger seat and like count his kicks and like I definitely felt him Mm -hmm. that Sunday okay um so then I went to work on Monday break was over I went to work and I just it was it was pretty normal in the sense of like you know I wasn't feeling great I was exhausted but I felt him a little bit again not as active he wasn't being as active as he was the entire pregnancy Um, so then Tuesday came around and I'll never forget. I was driving home from work and I called Tom and I said, I feel like we should go to the hospital. And it kind of like caught him off guard. And he was like, wait, what? And he was like, well, Herb, you have your appointment like right now. Why don't we just meet at the doctor's office Mm. and see, like go from there. So I was like, you're right. You're right. So I just, I drove right there. And I remember it was like being really nervous and saying to the nurse, I can't remember like the last time I felt him today. Um, And she kind of looked at me and she was like, really? Like, have you felt him at all? And I was like, I don't know. I just, I'm nervous. And she was like, okay, let's, you know, get, get the Doppler out. So she got the Doppler out and she found his heartbeat right away. Mm, Okay. And I was like, okay, like take a breath. Um, But then when the doctor came in, I did express to her, how I was just like, you know, it might just be me, but I feel like his movements are off. And Tom was like, can we get an ultrasound to check? And she was like, well, I can't just call in an ultrasound. Like you, ha- the, the baby is displaying a healthy heartbeat is what she called it. Um, mm-hmm. A very healthy heartbeat. And she got the Doppler out again, found it right away. And I forget like exactly how high the heartbeat was but like according to her like it was perfect Mm -hmm. for the time so I left that appointment um (laughs) I think she did actually say okay we can quote unquote fudge this and try to say because I gained a lot of weight during the pregnancy so I think she was she said something like I can put in this code and we can bring you in for an ultrasound next week so mm-hmm. I was like, okay, so it wasn't like anything urgent and, but they were going to offer me one possibly the next week. Gotcha. And so what, we left. Kirby, what sure. week were you when you went to this appointment? Um, 36 weeks. 36 weeks. Okay. Yes. So it was my dad's birthday. So we left the appointment and I remember thinking to myself, and I probably said it to Tom, like, I am a crazy person. I am always like, nervous that the worst is going to happen or like something bad's happening. And like, it's not like the baby's fine. And I just need to like go with that. Like, I just need to be like, okay, the baby's fine. The doctor's telling me the baby's fine. So we went to my um, parents and we ate dinner and everything. And then I went to work on Wednesday. And again, Wednesday was kind of like Monday, like I wasn't feeling great, but you know, pretty typical Mm -hmm. Thursday, we had a snow day. So I was off. So I was I remember I was just home organizing all the baby things and just cleaning and all that. For Thursday evening, I started to get a little bit of a headache and that wasn't typical. I, I hadn't had headaches like the mm. whole pregnancy. Like I'm sure I got one here and 
here or there, but that wasn't like a thing that usually happened. Mm -hmm. So I called the doctor and they said, okay, take Tylenol um, and call us back in the morning. Like if you still have it. So the morning came and I didn't really still have the headache, I don't think, but I just felt like so off. And so I said, my headache's like lingering and can I just come in? And they were like, okay, that's fine. Like you can come in, we'll check your blood pressure to see. I hadn't had like a history of high blood pressure during the pregnancy, but they just wanted to make sure because I had the headache. So I said, okay. So I went in and I remember Tom was, that was the, this was the first appointment that Tom wasn't at. Mm. He, um, but he was working in sales at the time. And so he was on the road a lot. So he said, okay, I'm going to make my way towards the doctor's office. And if you need me, like I'm on my way. Okay. And I was like, okay. So I walked in and it was, I guess like a nurse's aide or a nurse or someone took my blood pressure and they said, or she said, this is so low. Oh, like I've, I've never seen it so low. So then of course I can feel my heart like beating really fast. Cause I was like, I just got so weak. Like what, why is it low? Like where's Tom? And I remember saying to her, like, I need to call my husband. I need to call my husband. And she's like, just don't panic. I'm going to go get someone else to take it. So then someone else came in and it was normal. They said my blood pressure. So I was just hmm. so confused. They did. They did not check for the baby's um, heart rate or heartbeat at that time. It hmm. wasn't like a scheduled appointment. I, like I said, I just called and they said, okay, you can come in and we'll, we'll check your blood pressure. Looking back, obviously, like, yeah, I should have been a I mean, more of an advocate and been like, okay, what's going on here? And, um, but they just said like, okay, you can go on your way. Like blood pressure is fine. So like I left and I remember calling my mom on the way to work and we talked and I felt a little bit better. And then, so that was Friday. And so I, I do remember being at work that day and sitting at, a, I, I taught a lot of small groups and I remember sitting when my kids were taking like a test and I remember sitting there like putting my hands on my belly and like trying to feel him and I just I couldn't mm -hmm. and I was like oh this is like so frustrating like all week I've just been like in and out of this like what's happening so then on the way home um I didn't obviously didn't feel up for cooking I did say to Tom like I'll pick up dinner so I'll never forget I picked up Uno's and I got a salad and I was just kind of picking at the salad and then we went down went downstairs in the basement which was a normal routine for us just to kind of relax because like I said after seven o'clock I just always felt awful so I was laying on the couch and I remember like hearing my mom come in and she was coming to bring the Tommy, who we didn't know was a boy at the time, like I said, but his rocker for his nursery. So mm -hmm. she put that upstairs and she just kind of popped her head down. Um, and then she left. And I remember saying to Tom, he was watching basketball and kind of on his phone. And I remember saying, we, we need to go to the hospital. He was like, what? And I was like, I just, something's not, I, I, something's wrong. I just know. I just don't feel like everything's okay. And he was like, okay. And bless his heart. Because like I said, I, with my anxiety, I just, he was probably like, Kurt, we got this looked at, like you thought something was wrong. We got it looked at this week a few times, like things are fine. But I said, I just want to like, I just want to see the baby like on an ultrasound mm -hmm. and be like, okay, baby's fine. So we were driving to the hospital and obviously I was like nervous, but I wasn't thinking that he had passed away at all. I was thinking like, they were going to say like he was in distress and they were going to have to like do an emergency C-section and get him out, like worst case scenario. But I also thought, okay, I'm going to feel so good once I see the baby and right. then I'm just going to be able to go home and sleep. And the following day we were planning a surprise engagement party for Tom's um, brother and my now sister-in-law. So I just was like, I just want to like, I want to get this over with and have like see like peace of mind again yeah so I'll never forget like walking into the hospital and like pressing the button to the elevator and just like go riding up and thinking like am I feeling the baby like I don't know um I was having like contractions like 
where my stomach would just get, they, they weren't painful, but my stomach would just get tight. Mm. And so I was like mixing that up with thinking like, okay, is that him moving or not? So anyways, I checked in and that was a whole long process. And then they took me back to, and Tom was with me and we went back to this little room. So I have basically all the details of that room memorized and it was just this tiny little room. And uh, I got into the gown and the nurse came in and she said, okay, let's, let's check this baby out. And remember she put the Doppler on and I was like, just, you know, really still and trying to listen. And I didn't hear the, like the swishing noise right away. And I look over at her and I said, can you find his heartbeat? And she said, well, not yet. And so my heartbeat at that point, like, was racing. And then she said, okay, I might have found it. But really, it was picking up on mine because it was beating so fast. And she says, wait, that might be yours. I need to go get the doctor. And so obviously, at this point, like, I just like knew I was in so much shock, but I just like knew something awful. And Tom was like, like it, it might just be her like it might you know the doctor's coming the doctor's coming and but I remember just sitting there like staring I don't even think I was like crying at that point because I was just like so in so much shock so then they brought up the doctor with an ultrasound machine and the doctor said the same thing like okay let's check on the baby and she didn't seem panicked or anything. She just came in and I was laying there. And then she was like silent. And she said, okay, I'm going to need somebody to look at the screen. And I was just like, I can't, I can't look over there. And Tom like looked over and she said, look, like there's the heart and it's not beating. And like, I just like completely, like obviously like the most devastating thing that could ever happen to you or to me is happening and so I remember Tom said why and like it's true like why like why why is this happening like how could this happen I remember saying right away to her like am I gonna die too and she was like well we don't think so and I just kept repeating that and I think looking back I think I was thinking that because it was so unnatural to have my baby die. It just felt natural to like go with my baby. It just didn't feel like, like, how was I going to survive without my baby? I, I didn't understand that. So I did also say like, how are we going to get the baby out? And I suspected them to like, you know, call like a hospital emergency and put me right to sleep and like, rip this baby out of me and it it wasn't that at all everything was just so like quiet and she looked at me and she said well you could go home tonight and sleep and come back in the morning or we could induce labor tonight and I said I have to deliver the baby and she said like that's that's what we're re recommending and I remember just bawling to Tom and I, I do remember saying to him like like I just looked at him and he was just like staring at me like in disbelief and I remember saying like I know our baby because we didn't know obviously he was a boy at the time so we didn't know but I said like I know my Grammy is in heaven like holding him right now and like that's all I could like like grasp onto to like keep I don't even know keep breathing I guess and so I also remember saying like screaming to Tom like we have to call like my parents and tell them and I, they need to bring me a blanket I just kept saying I need a blanket I need a blanket I felt so out of my body like I just I wanted I guess I wanted to be out of my body I I couldn't believe this is happening and it's like life just stopped like the world stopped spinning and 
I feel like I needed, I, I guess I needed a blanket to like almost like anchor me down to the earth because I just felt like I was floating. I felt like it was the end of the world because to us it was. And so Tom called, um, the nurse said like, you want me to call family? And Tom said like, no, I'll do it. And like, I remember Tom saying like, oh, you're a poor mom because like my mom was so excited for the two her two first grandbabies to be two months apart and it's funny because she had always said that Casey my sister was gonna have a girl and I was gonna have a boy and it turns out she was right (laughs) and so I remember hearing like the sobs like coming through the phone and he as Tom like just said what is happening and they said like we're on our way and then Tom called his parents and in the meantime um they had us walk down to a different room and we sat in there and I remember like the doctor coming in, which is kind of like a blur at this point. But then all of a sudden I remember my family coming in and like, I remember like my, especially my one sister Courtney, like I just remember like the cries coming out of her. Like it was just like awful. And I remember saying like, where's dad? And they were like, he's parking the car. Like he'll be up. And, like, we just all sat there and bawled crying. And then um, the doctor um, and I guess nurses, or I guess the nurse came in and I had it. They had to take, like, a bunch of blood and do, like, blood work and get an IV going and all of that. And then they started um, inducing me. And so that night, this was like, it's probably like 10 o'clock by this point. Um, so my mom and my dad stayed with us through the night. And it was just like this night where, you know, we were just like on and off just crying as they were just inducing me. And it was just like really, really hard. Um, in the morning, my sister came um, and she sat out in the waiting room and by this time I was still like not really feeling much contractions or anything. So they like upped whatever they had to. And, and then I started like feeling more um, contractions, but still nothing painful. Day went on and then they started getting like closer together and more painful. And it was so sad because I only had to wear like the one band on my belly, which was tracking contractions and like not the heartbeat one. Yeah. It was just, and I just, th- at this time, like, I just remember like, I couldn't like not, I couldn't like fully believe what was happening still. I just was hanging on to this like small chance that this like miracle was going to happen and the baby was going to come out alive and just crying his head you know crying and I didn't I don't think I said that to anyone but I just later on like I remember Tom saying that he thought the same thing like this this can't be happening maybe they're wrong even though I knew that probably wasn't the case but I just was holding on to that hope and so I remember asking if my sister could come back and she did and so her and my mom were so great at like helping me through each of the contractions and like rubbing my back and helping me breathe through them. And uh, I remember, I'll never forget Kenzie, my sister. She, um, she French braided my hair and was just so sweet. And obviously Tom and my dad was, I think my dad was like in and out of the waiting room and in our room. So then again, labor kept progressing. And all of a sudden I was like, I really feel like I need an epidural like I'm in so much pain and so we told the nurse that and they said okay we'll call the anesthesiologist and like we'll get that started so that ended up being way longer than I thought I think it ended up being like two or three hours later is when they came in and at that point I was in so much pain um that it was even hard to do the epidural because they were doing it like in between contractions. Right. And I remember when anesthesiology came in, um, I remember saying I was just so nervous to like be left alone by myself. I didn't want to. And she said, well, 
this is a really unique like situation and we're going to let Tom stay with you. So even though it's a sterile procedure, he can stay with you and like hold your hand. So Tom helped me and I was like gripping onto this pillow and like in between contractions. And then they finally got the epidural in. And then I felt a lot of relief after that. Um, like physically, I felt Good. a lot of relief. And then I'm not kidding. The doctor came in to check me. Oh, I guess I forgot. I can't remember if they broke my water before or after the epidural, but the doctor came in at some point and was checking me and broke my water. And then it was not long. After. And she said, okay, I'll be back like in an hour to check you. And it wasn't like 10 minutes after that I said to my mom, I really feel like I need to push. And she was like, okay, let me go get the doctor. Like, let's see. And the doctor came in and was like, oh my gosh, you're ready. <laughs> and so I was like, oh my gosh. Okay. So at that point, uh, yeah, I was like, okay, here we go. And at that point, I remember my whole body was shaking. Like I was like uncontrollably just shaking. And I remember saying, um, I remember my dad saying, okay, I'm going to go. And my sister, and I was like, no, I need you to stay. I was like, I need you guys to stay. I can't do this by myself. And so my dad was on one side of like my back and then my mom was on the other. And Tom was like right here next to me. And like my sister Kenzie was over on my mom's side. And I was like, I need you guys to help me. I'm so scared. And so they were like the perfect team. And so I, I pushed and then um, a few, only a few times and I'll never forget the nurse saying like, your baby has a full head of hair. And like, it was just so heartbreaking. And, um, and then the nurse said like, I think Tom might need to sit down. And I look over at Tom and he's like, no, I'm fine. I just like, I heard that and I just got so sad. And um, the atmosphere in there, like, uh, it's like so hard to describe, but it was just oddly like so peaceful. Like the lights were dim and like I had like all the support around me, like helping me. And I like it was like honestly the first time that I've ever felt like the power of the Holy Spirit. Like Jesus was like in the room with me helping me because like it was something I could not do on my own. And I was just so distraught and all of a sudden, like, I just had this peace come over me, and I pushed again, and he was delivered, and the nurse was, like, he's so beautiful, um, do you want to know, like, if it's a boy or a girl, or do you want to keep going and deliver your placenta, and I said, I, I just want to keep going, so she took him over to clean him off, and I delivered the placenta, and then they were, like, doing whatever they had to do, um, and then I was like, obviously I've had so much guilt about this, but I was so scared to look at him at first. I was so nervous. And looking back, it's like, that's my baby. Like looking back, I wish that I did like skin to skin right when he was born. But obviously I did the best with what I knew and what I felt at that time. Um, but they cleaned him off and then they hand, the nurse handed him over to Tom and like, and Tom said, like, you have to hold him. He's so perfect. And I just looked at him. I was like, oh, my gosh. I don't know what I was expecting, but it wasn't that. He was, like, the prettiest baby I'd ever <laughs> seen. Like, everything, all of his little features, he was perfect. And I'll never forget looking down at his fingernails and being like, wow. He has, like, these, <laughs> like, even his fingernails are perfect. Um, So... Our priest came and blessed him and prayed with us. And I can't remember like how long I held him, but I just remember holding him and he felt so heavy and it just felt so good in my arms. And I just remember thinking like, why? I just want him to like, I can't believe this. But it was like the most beautiful, wonderful experience. <laughs> Yet at the same time, it was like by the... <laughs> greatest nightmare I could ever imagine happening so it was like there really was like this joy and pain that was just like coexisting in the same space and you know I really can't describe it any other way than that 
they did ask us if we wanted to take pictures and this is just on a side note um my poor cousin had lost her baby full term two months before us and Mm -hmm. when I was in labor that that day I remember saying to my mom can you please text Aunt Sally and like see like like how do we do this like obviously there's no like right way but like see if they have anything to like offer us and the one thing she said was like make sure you get pictures and she goes it it might sound like odd but like you're gonna want those so much and I mean it couldn't be more true um so we we agreed to now I lay me down to sleep coming in and taking photos of Tati and but something ended up happening and like it didn't work out. I, oh. I guess maybe the hour of the night or whatever reason they the nurse didn't put in the request in time. So um then a different nurse came in and took photos and she asked if that would be okay. And we said yes. And like we at that point it was just Tom's parents, my parents, and my one sister. Um, I think our priest had left and we were just all in the room and the nurse asked if anyone wanted to hold him. And so they all took a turn holding him. And, you know, like I said, like, you're just so, I was just so like in love with him. And I just couldn't believe this miracle that he was. And at the same time, I couldn't be more distraught. I was just so heartbroken. And um, our one nurse was just the sweetest, sweetest lady. And she was so kind to us. And she was the one who had taken the pictures. Um, they, she did give us the option of giving him like his first bath. And at the time, of course, one of my biggest regrets, we said like, no, no, no. Um, And so she said, okay, I'll bathe him and I'll bring him back like in a different outfit. And she did. And he had this little lamb that he was holding and this really sweet little hat. And he was wrapped in this white blanket. And we didn't unwrap him and like undress him again, looking back. Of course, I wish I did. Um, But we didn't. And but we just, you know, spent time with him and held him. And I think I was just staring at him and I remember just kissing his head and like thinking like, I'm so sorry this has happened. And we were given the option to keep him in our room. So hours and hours passed. Um, I'm not sure how long we were with him. And, but we were given the option of him staying until like however many hours until like the morning. Mm -hmm. And we declined it. We said like, no, like we think, this is a good time for like us to part and another regret. I, uh, there wouldn't have been enough time with him, even if we did spend those extra few hours, but looking back, like I really wish we did. Um, But Tom always tells me like, we did the best with what we could do. And he said like, at the time he felt like there was like only so much we could handle before we just lost ourselves all together and I do agree with him because I just like was losing my mind like I just like was so out of control and I just felt like we came I can't remember we like ended on a prayer or something and it was like a really like peaceful way to like hand him back to the nurse and uh, so horrible and heartbreaking um but then they asked us about funeral arrangements and you know all this stuff and I remember saying like what like oh my gosh I can't like make these decisions and I had all this paperwork I had to sign and like to this day signing my signature like I have flashbacks because it's just one of those like triggers for me um yeah I was just like signing his you know death certificate like (laughs) the worst thing ever Thankfully, my dad and mom really helped with arrangements um, regarding the funeral and the funeral home. Um, They took care of that. So they gave Tom, they called um, 
our church and the options where we could cremate him um, or we could bury him there. And one of the options was to bury him in a little garden, like full of, with other babies. Mm -hmm. And so of course I chose that. And like, I'm so happy that we did choose that option. And because it's, we call it his spot. Um, Cause I don't like saying like grave, I don't know. So we call it his spot, like his resting spot. And we go there um, because it's right, it's right beside our church. So obviously before COVID, we were going to church every Sunday, mm-hmm. but now we watch it at home, but we were going there weekly. Um, and just always, it, it and it's a peaceful spot for us. Um, so I'm really happy that he is there, but I'll go more into the um, funeral details in a little while, but I guess I'll just talk a little bit about um, leaving the hospital and what the days and weeks and months um, that followed kind of looked like. So we left the hospital empty handed and I was in a wheelchair and I remember saying to my mom, oh my gosh, when I put my jacket on, it zipped up and I wasn't able to zip it coming in because my belly was so big. And like, I was just like, oh, I cannot, again, like, I just can't believe this. And I had always pictured driving home from the hospital, just sitting in the back with the baby and just like watching the baby and you know, and so I was up front with Tom and I just cried the whole way home. I mean, there was no, there was nothing else to do. It just felt awful. So when we got home, I was really nervous to go home too, because I knew that the whole house was ready for the baby. I mean, we even had diapers on each floor, like just all set to go. So I couldn't have been more relieved. Um, Bless my sister's heart. And it it was probably like all of my sisters and my brother who did it, but they came over and they just set everything aside in the nursery upstairs. And so they cleared out all the baby things um, and they set up the basement for us and in like the most cozy environment (laughs) that you could imagine. I mean, she even brought a mini fridge like over to our house and downstairs like on her own and I found out later like it's the heaviest thing ever but she just did it and they had snacks set up and drinks and just every blanket that we owned and pillow and it was just like this cozy little area for us that ended up being our hideout for the next two weeks um so I remember laying on the sofa and I just wanted to write down our story. I wanted to write down every detail of the hospital stay and everything that I was feeling because I never wanted there to be a time where I couldn't remember. So that's what I did. I typed out everything. We we couldn't read, uh, sorry, read. We couldn't watch TV. It almost felt like there was like this giant line separating our life, like before Tommy and after. And I didn't want to do anything that was like that we did before. And Tom felt the same way, like even the TV, turning the TV on, like it just felt so wrong. So I remember Tom was like looking up stories about other people who had had babies pass away. And so after I read our story, I remember doing the same thing. I was just like reading story after story and finding people. Um, on social media and just trying to connect, um, not on like, I wasn't like talking to them, but just connecting through their stories, through reading their stories. So my mom stayed with us, which was so good. She stayed with us for a while. Um, and this was amazing because we couldn't have, it, it almost felt like we were like young children again. Like we could not meet like our basic, like we couldn't, cook food or like we weren't even hungry um we just didn't have motivation to do anything and it was like the first time that we realized like okay I understand how people hit rock bottom and like Tom and I talked about it like we we get it like there's like if that at that point if you could if you told me like I'm taking your house and I'm taking this like I would have said like take it I, I truly don't care I was just in such like deep dark grief and um 
I did sleep a lot, I guess, but waking up was like so hard. I like would jolt awake and be like, oh my gosh, it's so true. It's I'm waking up in this nightmare again. Like this is still happening. How is it still happening? And in the morning, especially for the first few weeks, like I didn't recognize, like, I remember my mom would go home and shower and, um, I was just there. And I remember like crying to the point where like, I couldn't even recognize like who, what are these like screams coming out of me? Like, I just was like, this is just so, so hard. So the hospital, like I said, had taken pictures and they gave us this little box and it ended up being in the corner um, of the basement. And I remember again, I was so nervous to like go over and like look at him. And there was just one night in the middle of the night that I just couldn't function. And I just had to go see him. So I got, took all the pictures out and I remember just like touching his face on the picture and just like, it felt so comforting to me. Um, as I just sat there crying, but it just, it just felt right to just see him. Um, so a couple came from our church who had had a similar experience to us. And that was maybe just a few nights in. And it was like the first time I could ever take like a breath. Like I felt like I took a breath that I had been holding since delivering him. And I just like looked at these people and they were so sweet and so kind and they prayed with us and they talked with us and they shared their story. And I just felt, I was so thankful. And it was the first time that I felt like I had some hope of like, wow, they are however many years out um, after losing their daughter. And like, they look okay. Like they, they drove here and they, they're talking to us and like, they brought us cookies, like they're functioning, like, maybe we will too one day. And something else that was like really, really, really amazing. Um, my mom's friend gave her a devotional called Jesus Calling. And we had no idea what it was, but my mom started reading it. Um, it was a daily devotional. And so we read one, obviously one day at a time. And it just like, couldn't be more right. Like it was so fitting. Like it just felt like Jesus is talking directly to us and saying like, it's going to be okay. Like I'm going to carry you through these hardest days of your life. And so we went to, um, to church, I think that Monday to meet with the, um, bereavement counselor and plan out the funeral. Um, and again, I was so nervous to see anyone. Um, I just, I didn't, it was just something that I can't even describe it. I was just so nervous to see people and nervous of what I didn't want to talk to anyone. I didn't want to like share my story. I was just so nervous. And my cousin was teaching at the school at the time, the school that's connected to um, the church. And we saw her walking in and I think she like stopped to like Yes, maybe. And I just lost it crying. And I was like, Mom, I can't see her. I can't talk to anyone. And then my cousin was so sweet and just waved like, okay. I'm like, it's okay. Um, so we went in and we planned um like the readings for the funeral and talked a little bit with the bereavement counselor. Then the next his funeral wasn't until a few days after we had planned it. Um, but we spent the next days kind of like, and I guess the, really the next weeks and months kind of like doing things that didn't make it worse, if that makes sense. So like yeah. we did things that felt okay. Um, we went to the mall and we got like necklaces made um, and engraved with his name. And like to this day, like I'm wearing mine, I'm holding it right now. Um, and like that felt good. So ultimately, like we would do things that like, like reading someone else's story or like connecting with another lost mom or just things that felt fine. Um, because we knew ultimately we were gonna go back down. I call it like the hole, <laughs> like we were kind of sink back down in the hole. So like we had to like keep ourselves afloat as much as possible. Mm -hmm. What, but with that being said, I, and Tom feels the same way. Like 
what has been so healing throughout our grief journey is feeling all the emotions. So not pushing them away. So I do, I am guilty of like to this day, like I like to like cry when I'm like alone. I don't, I'm not like a, I can't easily like cry in front of people, but like when I'm driving in the car, like I'll cry. Or like when I'm in the shower, if I need to cry, like I'll cry. But, um, where was I going with that? Feeling all the emotions. Yeah. 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 So thank you. So yeah, just feeling all the emotions. Like if we felt good, like we were going to like, just let ourselves feel good, like, and not feel guilty about it. Like, okay, I'm feeling okay. I feel like I can go out on a walk today with my mom. Like I can do that. And, but then if we felt awful, like that's fine too. Like sit, we had to like sit in each of the feelings and like the waves of grief because we had to feel it to like process it. And I, uh, Tom and I, obviously like everyone grieves differently and Tom and I definitely did grieve a lot differently. I had to talk through my feelings and all the details. So my mom being the sweetest person that she is, um, she let me do this over and over and over. We walk miles and miles each day. Um, <laughs> and I just retold her all the details and all the hospital stays and all the questions that I had. And that was so therapeutic to me. Like to this day, I, I really like sharing in support group um, about Tommy and his story and, you know, how I'm feeling and how I felt back then. And like, it, it helps me heal, I feel like. And Tom felt like re replaying all the events just really hindered his healing process. Mm-hmm. He felt like, oh my gosh, why are you talking about this? It's so hard in general. And then it's just making it harder. So I was thankful to have my mom and like my therapist to talk about it with because, and obviously my sisters, um, brother, like anyone who would listen, like I, I liked to talk things through. We, so we had the funeral and we just did immediate family. Um, and again, I don't regret that. It was so hard to see anyone. And I just kind of like, wanted to like be in a shell. Um, I did not want to see people. I didn't, the last thing I wanted to do was talk to people or have people look at me. Um, so we had this really intimate ceremony and it was, it was great. I, Tom and I wrote Tommy a letter that our piece read and it was just really peaceful. Um, you know, obviously heartbreaking, but it was a, it was a, a really beautiful ceremony. So Fast forward um, to like two weeks later, Tom had to go back to work. Um, So my mom did stay with me during the days to keep me occupied. And that was really nice. Um, And she, again, continued to make us dinner. And it was just so nice to have that support and to be able to just accept the help because I needed it. I'll never forget. I shared this once at support group. Um, My shampoo was like running out one time in the early days. And I remember thinking like, oh, wow, my shampoo is running out and there's no way I can possibly function to get more shampoo. Like I just couldn't do it. So Mm -hmm. it was so nice to have my mom for a lot of reasons, but for things like that, like she could just like restock our stuff without me having to like function enough, well enough to go to in a store. So we were given the opportunity to go to this faith-based conference called Choose Joy um, a few months after losing Tommy. And it was one of the best things that's ever happened to me. It was so amazing. It was about um, infertility and just infant loss. And it was people from all around the United States came together to Georgia and for like a three day conference. And we just like talked and related. And it felt so good because connecting with other people who understand or at least understand to an extent of what I was walking through was like what kept me going. And like to this day, I feel like connection is so, it's just beautiful because you can relate. And I could no longer relate to so many, um, I guess like people in my life, um, like who weren't walking through this. It was so hard to like, hold a conversation or have small talk. You know, I just wasn't like, I couldn't even focus enough to do it. I was just, I couldn't. So having this um, 
conference where I could like actually talk to people who got it and understood what like hard was. I mean, it was, it was great. And it was really, really healing for Tom too. Um, something else that I found that was really healing was my sister Kenzie and I went on a for the moment trip to South Carolina. Mm-hmm. And that was, we visited my, my cousin who had also lost her mm-hmm. son, like I said, two months before us at 38 weeks. And so we were able to see her in person and talk with her and spend time with her. And it was just so amazing. Um, like so good. We, we had like the best, I can't even remember how many days we were there, but it was so nice and so freeing and it just felt right. Um, I did take a lot of time off of work. Um, and I got an extension for my master's class to finish this class. They gave me like a crazy long extension. Um, and I didn't, I actually did not end up completing the course, um, because I just couldn't focus. I, my, I couldn't get myself to focus. And I think maybe because then Like I could focus on the things that were like really meaningful to me, but I guess at that point it wasn't Mm -hmm. that meaningful to me. So I just, I couldn't focus to do it. And I thought, well, that's okay. (laughs) Like, that's okay. I'm just not going to do it. Um, I did go back to work, which was really, really hard. My school um, was amazing. And one of my biggest support systems, and to this day, I have some of my best friends who I met them through working at this school. and they were just so amazing. Like they would check in and continue to check in. And if I didn't answer, they would just continue to check in. And that was so helpful. Um, because I I couldn't talk and I didn't want to. And, but they were just like letting me know, like they were still there and I could take my time. And so going back to work, um, it was really hard. I, we didn't, this was just like looking back, I wish we had said something, but I worked with young kids and they obviously all knew that I was having a baby. And we went back and forth. We met with the principal and assistant principals and we went back and forth. Like, do we tell them? Like, does the school tell them? Like, and I'm not sure that the school had ever had anything like this. So they weren't sure exactly how to like navigate the situation. And we didn't end up telling the kids. Um, the, the whole thing was like, just say like, yes. Like if the kids ask, like, yes, I had my baby, you know, it, he's a boy and his name's Tommy and we're going to talk about like school stuff now. And because like my principal said, like, that's the truth. Like you did have a baby in his name, you know, and I was like, okay. But the anxiety that I felt going back to work was just so hard. I remember sitting in my car, like with my stomach, like I had never had such bad, like physical symptoms Mm. from anxiety before. And Mm. I remember just being like, Oh my gosh, I can't do this. It's all I can take to like walk in the building. And it was, it was hard. It was definitely hard being back at work. And then I would have these sweet little kids come up to me and you have your baby yet. And Oh my gosh, it was really tough. Um, yeah. But like I said, I did have some of my best friends there. And it it was hard for me to see pregnant people and people with newborn babies. That was really, really hard for me to see. Um, And so another reason why it was really hard to go back to work. So I did get through the, um, the year. And then I guess I'll talk about this a little bit later. But I didn't end up going back to work the following school year. Mm. And it ended up being because of our adoption story. Yeah. So like it all worked that worked out yeah. beautifully. But yeah. um but yeah, I I did make it to summer. <laughs> so that was good. It was only a few months left that I had, but it was hard. It was hard stepping back into a place that I had all of these hopes and dreams about this baby and all of these memories from the pregnancy. It was really hard to step back into that. It felt like I was like stepping back into an old reality with this new reality. Mm -hmm. And that was really difficult. Yeah. Um, but overall, I, I feel like I have to say this, like Tommy has a hundred percent changed our life and mostly for the better. Um, our priest said to us, uh, when we were at the hospital, 
that this baby will do more for you in heaven than you could ever do for him on earth. And that was so hard to hear. And I couldn't, couldn't begin to wrap my head around that because I just, I wanted him. I wanted him here. And I feel like three years down the road, I truly, truly believe that he's given us a second chance. Tommy has given us a second chance to live. And like, he's given us these eyes, new eyes to see like all of God's beauty and just all notice all the little things that we were just like, or at least I was like walking through life, not noticing because I was so worried about crossing things off of my to-do list and working so many hours at night after school to like make sure I had my IEPs written perfectly because I was in special education and make sure I had the perfect lesson plans and spending all my time on the weekend, you know, working. And then suddenly I was like, wow, like now I'm just like, wow, life has completely changed. I'm a completely different version of myself, but definitely a better one. Um, Like new ears to listen and a heart that's just full of compassion for others. Um, a completely redefined faith. Uh, I just have so much faith and I give all of the miracles and the blessings that have happened along the way. I give all the glory to God. Jesus was always a huge part of my life growing up and now he's definitely the center of it. And I feel like because we know what it feels like to have like the ultimate low, the highs are so much higher and so much greater. And we're just better parents to Ace and Miles. Um, And we just, I think the one gift that I love so much that Tommy's given to me is the gift of living in the moment. So like I said, I used to have like to-do lists and like, I don't make those anymore. Like I just take each day as it comes and we just do all the fun things and the goodness. Um, We do um, spread. So we started this early on the month after he was born. So he was born on the sixth. Um, and every month since then, we've done act of kindness, like spread kindness in honor of him on the sixth of the month. Mm. So that's like our thing. It's like every six of the month, we do acts of kindness. And that's been such a wonderful way to honor him. <laughs> and it just, it feels right to bless other people in honor of him. So. That's so, Um, so beautiful. That's so cool that you guys do that. Thank you. (laughs) We are walking through another like very, very challenging situation or season um, in our lives. And it is because my brother is walking through cancer and my brother, anyone who knows him knows he is like the greatest person ever. And I remember saying that if I had a boy, I wanted him to grow up like LJ like because Jerry's just like the greatest guy and something that I always say to him is like in ordinary life like the definition of like an ordinary life looks different well we'll look different for everyone but what I always say is that like God chose Jerry and I always think this about myself too like God chose me like not to have like this ordinary life where you just like go through the motions but to have this like extraordinary one where like you go through something so, so hard and it's always going to like be with you like that, like that season, but like you're going to impact so many people and help so many people and you're going to change for the better. I feel like it really is like through the hardest, most impossible situations that we find out really who God calls us to be. And so I know that God's working miracles through Jerry and I see it like, daily when I look at him and I'm just like this is I mean he's so incredible and he's just an inspiration for all of us something that's really special is him and I are going to we're in the process of starting a nonprofit in honor of Tommy and we're going to our mission or our goal is to help other people who have obviously had sober babies um, babies who have passed away in infancy um, pregnancy loss but also people who are walking through cancer. So it's helping, like, we just want to help like people who need us the most. And we're going to do that through acts of kindness. Like that's going to be the goal of, or the purpose rather of our nonprofit. So we're really looking forward to, to that and all that's going to 
come from it. So much good. I am sh- I am sure of it. It sounds like already with the your acts of kindness that you do on the sixth of the month that that is helping a lot of people too. I think that's so neat that you guys are doing that. Thank you. It it really is. We love doing it. So that's awesome. Kirby, I have a quick question for you. Did you guys ever find out what happened to Tommy? Oh, yes. So it was, um, it's called a maternal fetal hemorrhage mm. It is what they called it. So the hospital and we did have an autopsy performed and um, it came back kind of like inconclusive. Okay. I don't know if I said that right, yeah. but um, our doctor said that the cause was unknown. However, we did visit and talk with a, um, a high risk doctor mm-hmm. and he read through everything and he said that he believes what happened was a maternal fetal hemorrhage. So it's really rare about like one in 1000 chance of happening in an otherwise healthy pregnancy. And basically the best way I can describe it is like the placenta like reverses at some point. And basically um, Tommy lost like almost all of his blood to me. Like, yeah. And that's, that's what happened. Oh, wow. Was... Yeah. <laughs> you're like, and there's nothing that you, yeah. It's so funny how you're like, I can't do anything about that. That just, it happened. And it, Happened to me, the one in 1,000 pregnancy. Exactly. Tom was like so caught up on these statistics. Again, I have trouble saying that word, but he was so bent out of shape about these statistics. And I'm just like, I don't know, Tom. He's like, this, like, what? This is, this is so rare. This is so rare. Like, you know, how many people like, you know, go to the hospital to deliver their baby and get to bring their baby home and like, you know. Yeah. So. But yes. Um, Oh, and then I guess the last thing I could end on, I'm not going to give like details, but I will say um, we adopted our rainbow baby Ace and he is the sweetest guy ever. And he was born in Mississippi and we were able to be there at his birth, which was amazing. Um, We have an open adoption with his family and they are the sweetest people that you'll ever meet. So we just feel like the road, the adoption journey is very, very, I don't even know how to describe it. It's intense. Um, Mm -hmm. And all of the details that had to fall in place in order for Ace to join our family, like it's none other than just like divine intervention. Like God, like truly led this little, this little guy to us. And he is just like such a light to everyone who he encounters. Um, And when we when we were on the adoption journey, um, we found out that we were expecting again. And so, which is so (laughs) when you told me this, I was like, what? (laughs) I know it's so crazy. Again, it's just like this miracle on top of a miracle. (laughs) Um, and so we, pregnancy as for loss is, was very, very, very challenging for me, but I did have little Ace um, in my arms, so I was taking care of. So that was just, again, such a blessing. Um, but Miles, um, that's our, uh, our other rainbow baby. His name is Miles. And the two of them are six months apart, and they are just best friends. And it it really is such a beautiful story. And they their connection, I just feel, is so strong. And they talk about Tommy because we – obviously share share him and his goodness with them and so that just feels so good too whenever they say like Tommy Tommy um and we'll talk about more about this on the advice episode but we do think about Tommy with anchors so whenever they see an anchor they'll also say like point to it and say Tommy which is really oh, sweet. <laughs> so sweet oh I love it Kirby thank you so much for sharing your story about Tommy and I'm so sorry. It's so hard. It's just so hard when you, uh, yeah, there's that deep grief hole. Is that what you call it? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, but I'm grateful that it sounds like Tommy is, is quite, a, like you said, an anchor or a light to you guys. Um, is there any one last thing that you'd like to tell us about Tommy before we close up today? Just how, how much we love him and how our love grows for him every day. And we were so nervous. At least I was in the hospital because it just felt like he was being ripped away from me 
forever. And now I realize like how not so far away heaven is and how it's, it's not goodbye, but he, it's more like see you later. So, so thankful for him. And we are so thankful for all the special ones, all the special people who kept us afloat and carried us through, lifted us up and carried us through. Thank you so much again, Kirby. Thank you. 